In a lot of my recent episodes, probably going back uh, six months or so, I do talk about performance a lot. And I use sports, the arts, the military as analogies or examples. And some people misinterpret, oh, if you didn't do that, then you can't be good at sales. That's not true. They're just examples. Um, you know, I wasn't big into sports. I did it. Uh, a lot of individual sports like running, cross country type stuff, did the baseball. But that behavior of being able to take feedback, to be able to uh, think differently, to listen to other people, and to then re-execute and approve. And there's a lot of ways you can do it. You can do it through video games. You can do it through cooking. Anything where you get a feedback loop and it's not just a quiz. I mean, even in school where uh, you get close contact with either a tutor or or a teacher, somebody who's willing to discuss how to make what you're doing better. Because especially when you're dealing with people, because people, we get false positive and false negatives, meaning since everybody's different, nothing's going to work 100% of the time. I mean, if you look at politics, no matter what decision a politician makes, at best, you're going to get what? 60, maybe 70, possibly eight. Someone's going to hate it and have a, a decent argument against it on both sides. So the idea that you're ever going to get 100 is a false premise. And I think a lot of people in sales look for the, the silver bullets. That something that'll work every time. At best, think 80%. If you can get 50% in sales, you're going to be very rich. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about these metaphors for sales and self-improvement today. Uh, I think we all can use a little pump me up right now. Uh, I'm going to dive into the interview a little quick here. Make sure you're checking out our friends over at CoVideo, looking for a different way of connecting with your clients. That's really powerful. I'll give everybody an update on the course. Just please make sure you're listening to the office hours and the one-on-ones and scheduling them. That's all in the very first chapter, as well as the times uh, and Zoom link to connect with it. Here we go with the interview. Hey, Paul, welcome to the show as a way of getting started. Tell us about yourself. Hey, Brian, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm actually in Canada today, Ottawa, Canada, capital, similar to D.C. Uh, went to a minus uh, 100 degree t- t- Fahrenheit temperature swing the past few days, so yeah. from Florida, Ottawa. Uh, but I, I've been uh, working with sales teams and uh, as a mentor and a coach, really, um, because, you know, good managers are coaches, of course. And uh, I've been doing this for a while and uh, uh, working for a company called Better Software. All we do is franchising, but we've also built, uh, I'm in charge of partners for a company called Ruckify and Ruckify RV. They're the world's largest rental marketplace. So it's kind of interesting. And uh, so software basically, and uh, lots of fun. And, you know, anytime there's so much change uh, in business to today as there always has been, um, I think we're going through another seismic shift um, in terms of what's happening with retail and these types of things. And uh, that's why I'm so excited about marketplaces. Uh, but yes, yeah, so that's my background in a nutshell. Um, I'm probably, you know, the only Canadian that uh, is not a huge hockey fan, even though I have a Senator's yeah. jersey behind me. <laughs> and uh, I should have been, you know, we have an office now in Texas. And, and, and that's where I'm spending my time too. Yeah, it's weird. This week, uh, half the interviews were with people in Canada. So <laughs> You know why? Because they got... Because you know what? They're not going outside to the beach right now. Yeah, they got plenty they got of lots time of time in the house. For yeah. <laughs> cool. So tell us your view on sales. Yeah, well, um, I think that in sales, uh, one of the biggest things, first of all, anybody says they have it all figured out is lying to you, right? right? Um, but you have to be a constant student. That's what I enjoy about your podcast so much. And I'm always learning and from other people. Um, can we take a little bit from everybody we meet if we're smart? And if you just took one tool in your toolbox from everybody you met, you'd be pretty accomplished after a while. Yeah. Right. And of course you got to throw a few tools out here and there. Um, no pun intended, but in terms of sales, I think fear is a big thing. And that's kind of how we first started chatting. You and I, um, is that I think a lot of salespeople have fear, um, be it, their approach or not believing in what they're doing or, you know, it's not easy, um, you know, to reach out to somebody, however, the mode you reach out to them, um, there's always fear of rejection. Right. Right. 
And some people, it actually gets worse as they get going. And, and years later, it's even become, they become really fearful. So it, it doesn't help. Um, and then I think our clients, uh, some people say sex sells. I've always thought fear, fear is the biggest motivator. You know, sex, we all think <laughs> It's never worked for sell. me. <laughs> yeah, well, me too. Hey, right. Well, <laughs> I'm not selling with sex, man. But fear, you know, the fear of not performing or not having something done or, you know, being passed in the marketplace. That's a real fear today. Yeah. How, how did you get over it in your sales career? <sighs> well, I think it's just learned. And, but I think it's about having a good heart. And I think if you have a good heart, it solves a lot of problems. And, and so, you know, what I want to talk about is maybe just a couple of little tiny stories. I think life's about stories. We have an oral tradition. Yeah. And uh, from our caveman days, right before there were books or anything or podcasts, we told stories. Yeah. And I think people relate to stories. And um, one thing is, and I don't know if you know this, Brian, I'm a football coach, right? I know that, yeah. So, you know, as the NFL, 2014 NFL Youth Coach of the Year, I brought the little plaque here. It's kind of shiny. We believe you. And, <laughs> but it's, all, it's also a good weapon, right? If you yeah. Know, yeah. So, um, so in, in doing that, um, there's a couple little stories. And I don't think I'm the best coach by any extremes, uh, you know, X and O's, there's so many better people, but a decent coach, absolutely. And what I'm known for is relating to people, and especially youth that are are poor, uh, you know, underprivileged, these types of fo- youth in bad situations, that's my strength. Yeah. Why? Because I grew up as one, okay? So I totally speak the language and I relate to them. And two little stories, tiny ones. Um, I had, I had um, so I'm working in the, this project area and Ottawa's a pretty uh, well-off place. It's about a 1.4 million, a third French, two thirds English. Um, like DC said, we have a, where our company's based, a tech campus of 20,000 engineers. If you've heard of Mitel or New Bridge Alcatel. Yep. Lucid, I used companies. to call on Ottawa. Yeah. yeah. So you know the area. So yep. the tech campus in Canada where the hockey team is, yep. is actually, you know, very engineered based, right? But then for the rest of the town is a government town. Now, Shopify is also from here, and they've been making a lot of waves too, right? So the tech has exploded here, and it has it pretty much everywhere. But one of the things is, is that in terms of, uh, of working in this one community where I was born, it's 4,000 youth there, uh, and they've got nothing. Like I have kids, mostly immigrants, and they show up in Canada with bare feet to a, a, a you know, the worst field in the city of bare feet or in dress shoes, okay? Yeah. Now, their parents are all, you know, new Canadians. Um, and I, I see the situation in my, you know, I've been working there for, you know, 15 years. And I enjoy coaching and because coaches for me were like fathers, right? They helped me get ahead. So if I can pay it forward, why not? And I really enjoy it. It keeps you young. And so I'm working in this one area, again, of, of, of you know, this one area. I don't know why they always want to put every all the poor people together. It's the worst idea I've ever heard, and they keep doing it, or whoever they are, governments, right? It's a horrible idea. <laughs> they just sprinkled everybody out to be a lot better, but they right. put all in one area. Now, I've got players now from this area. At Oklahoma will be a first-round pick in the NFL, a uh, couple from Penn State and Michigan, and the list of the pipeline is incredible, right? From this area, you wouldn't think Canada would be producing these athletes. More like on hockey are. players than football. Yeah, there are. But these guys can't afford hockey, right? Hockey's expensive. Yeah. It is expensive. And my nine-year-old said, Dad, I want to play hockey. I said, oh, God, son, I've been playing football since you're 60. You sure you want to play hockey? <laughs> yep. So anyways, it's not skiing, no, hockey. All right. So yeah, I said, well, I don't know much about hockey. But I don't need to skate. So 100 lessons later from a Russian figure skating coach, I think you do a triple soccer. So, so back to football. So, so I'm working in this area. And one story is the kids come to me and say, coach, are you a loafer? And I said, what's a loafer? A loafer? Me a loafer? I said, yeah, are you a loafer? I said, well, uh, what do you mean? They said, well, the coach, these are the people that come to our community once a year. And they bring us a turkey. I said, well, that's pretty good. A loafer? I count, sign me up. Oh, I'm, I'm a loafer. He said, yeah, but coach, we never see him again. Yeah. And, and, and believe it or not, these kids have been rejected. They've been kicked out of every school. They've been in trouble. And, you know, to a, you know, seeing, seeing, uh, you know, a white guy come in the community and here and gone, their attentions are good, but they all, they're always saying, well, they come, but then they leave. We don't see them again. And these kids will never look you in the eye. So they say to me, 
well, I'm looking at your shoes. You got nice shoes. You got nice loafers. So that's only a 13 or 14 year old kid would come up with that term. Are you a loafer? Yeah. Okay. So, so I always say, no, I'm not a loafer. Definitely not. I'm here and I'm not leaving. Okay. So that was one tiny little story of working in the community and about kids being fearful because they're fearful. They're just fearful getting home at night. You know, one of my calls to action, there was three shootings in one night, sorry, three, in a, three nights in a row. And I said, well, that's crazy. That's where I'm from. And I, I don't accept this. So, and in Ottawa and in, in Canada, one time we thought gangs, is it the Beavers, the Boy Scouts, or the Cubs? Not any longer. These are hardened criminals that are young and uh, and they're shooters, and uh, they go from one city to the next, uh, paid for hire, and it's trouble. Yeah. So it, it's everywhere, right? So um, and it's a shame because if these kids could just and I reach out to them, see you know if you did the earning potential of having just a, a decent job, you'd be way off ahead when you know at the time you're 35 or 40, you wouldn't have your your life. You'd probably be still living. So, so these are some of the discussions, hard discussions. That's it. I think there's a big misunderstanding that the only choices you have are crime or minimum wage. And well, no, I, these kids got a lot of stuff because I'll tell you, all those guys playing D1 programs, here's the difference. They're not coddled. They've all got degrees. Some of them, they're second degrees. No shortage of brain power there. Yeah. Right. And then they have something else, drive, and they can size up a situation in two minutes, something right. you can't teach a lot of other people. Summary of the situation, right? B&G days, right? Well, that's it. And that adversity does give you motivation well, as opposed to the... It, they'll take it the good way or the bad way, but they've got it. So they, yeah. they don't have money or, you know, and, and, and nutrition's an issue and all these things. But I said, listen, you got something that a lot of kids don't while they're on their PS4s nonstop, right? Or PlayStations. Yeah. And that's that's your drive. And you can channel that drive. And, and the business that I've been in franchising is a great place to start, right? Right. That's, you know, anybody talking about an upward mobility ladder, you know, you can start just working for a franchise, franchise location. Next thing you know, you're managing. Next thing you know, you're running your own franchise, maybe having a few. So it's the ultimate ladder. Right? And as far as I'm seeing the community. And, and how do you engage them in, in sports? Is it, are they already interested oh, in it? Or? Well, let me tell you a story. So that's here's the second story. So coaches love to yell, Brian. You know that? We yeah. love to yell. Megaphone. You get the whistle. Megaphone, whatever, yeah. <laughs> Big voice. We love to yell. Listen, these kids, most of them are F-ups. You can't yell at them. Yeah. They've been yelled at white guys all their lives, okay? And, he, and, and so what I don't do, I don't yell at them. And I, trust me, I want to lose my proverbial, you know what, all the time, throwing a clipboard down, you know, crazy. But if I'm just one more guy yelling at them, they just turn off their, they turn off their ears pretty quickly. And, again, they've been warehouse moved from school to school. So what I'll do is I'll say, listen, uh, I'll pick a name, Ahmed, okay? Ahmed, I know you don't trust me, but I'm not giving up on you, and I'm going to prove it to you. So while every other coach is making that kid run laps, and he's a pretty good athlete and, and all these things, I'm like, no, no, no laps. We'll, I'll, we'll kneel down on the field and one-on-one -on -one chat eye to eye. And from that discussion, okay, they still screw up, Okay. But after a while, and these kids are smart. Again, they size things up pretty quickly, some of the situation, and they know BS. They've got great BS meters, okay? okay? And one of the problems, you think even the sales teams, that we give a lot of false praise. There is nothing worse in this world than giving somebody false praise or a participation trophy. They know it, yeah. right? So if you spare the praise, I know it's kind of old school, spare the praise. But when it's real, it takes time and, and constantly. Like, I, I mean, I have to have patience. I say, how do you get this patience? And I don't know how I get it. But working with these kids, I just wear them out after a while. So after about four or five, six weeks in that time frame, typically, where most guys have kicked them off the team, uh, we have a lot of chats, okay, one-on-one. -on -one. And from that, um, I will, because their parents, typically their parents aren't there. They're working like three jobs all night, minimum wage, you, you name it, right? They don't speak the language or something. And, and I'll say – to my loudest voice. Now I'm going to yell, but I'm going to yell in front of adults, not false praise. Say, Ahmed, you didn't go offside. You had two quarterback pressures and you played smart and you held up your competitors every time off the field. So they were running away from you in the fourth quarter. I want to tell you that's the best job I've ever seen you do here. And I'll yell as loud as I can in front of other adults. Yeah. Okay. Now, now here's the magic. Next day I see Ahmed coming across the parking lot in practice. He's literally six feet off the floor walking on air. Got him. Next one. Got him. Got him. Got him. Okay. So then all of a sudden, 
I get calls from the school. And the school say, say, listen, what's up with Ahmed? All he talks about football, Coach Paul, football, and, and all positive things. He's not disturbing. And I said, well, uh, and I said, Ahmed, I get a call from your school, the good type. What do you think? Oh, no, no, Coach, I don't want those calls. I said, listen, take them, okay? And I said, Ahmed, what? tell me about school, because this is your real question. You know, what if it's not sports? And I say, what else interests you in life? And I have my standard line, or what interests you in school? And I, I say, don't tell me recess or lunch, because that's what they all answer, right? Yeah. And I said, okay. Um, so from that, um, what is it, music maybe? English? Shakespeare's a pretty cool dude, actually. You know, I know that's like the, it sounds a little, you know, the, the language is all weird and stuff, but the stories are great, right? Or, you know, is it math? I like math because you always get an answer. Or usually, anyways, or you know, or history, man. Because if you li- step back in the people's ages and how they lived, it's incredible how lucky we are today. So all those things, you find out what else they're interested in. Often. It could be music, actually. Often it's music for some reason. And next thing I know, I say, well, what have you thought about that anymore? And next thing I start working with the teacher, and and I said, I think oh, man, now you're the teacher's pet, are you? Oh no, no, no. But all of a sudden, we're getting through to these kids, and that's what the NFL recognized. Simple as that was. Uh, was working with the youth and and when you get through to them then they're so well i talked about those d1 football players and the, and the guy that's going to be drafted in the first round number 90 from oklahoma i guarantee you that the biggest thing for me is when they're taxpayers when they're cops doctors lawyers uh teachers you know just you know just guys contributing to me that's the positive thing and yeah. that's what's happening in this community it's not easy it's still a lot of trouble a lot of gangs but, you know, I don't get threatened as much anymore. So, <laughs> well, that's kind of good, right? Because they know you're trying to help, right? Yeah. And if they're going to sell drugs, they're going to sell drugs, right? And you can't save everybody. And every time there's a shooting or a stabbing or something, I kind of look and say, do I know the kid? It's probably yes. And so, let's map this to sales. How do you help reps get over that fear of rejection, the fear of failure? So what I would say is that you have to have a good heart, number one. Sales is not for everybody. I often hear people tell me that they want to go to sales because they like people. I can't think of a worse reason to go to sales because you like people. Yeah. Sometimes you got to be a little tough, right? Tell them what you don't want to hear because you're trying to help them. Okay. Yeah. And, and from that, that toughness and, and in terms of fearful is that if you don't have a good heart and you don't believe in what you're doing, right? If you believe what you're doing, and you're not fearful, you will call anybody or, or reach out to anybody, CEO on down. Because you know, it may not be not today, it may be not now, but it's not no, right? You know that from those old adages. But you also have a good heart about it. If you have a good heart, you're fearless. And when you're fearless, that's when the magic happens. Just like old Ahmed coming off the field and teachers calling, you know what? You know what? Your customers will start calling, you see? Because I'm just trying to help you. And you don't have to say it. They know if you're trying to help them by all the little things you do, right? And and next thing you know, uh, if you develop a process, use the you know, not process, process. If you develop the process, so the customer's following that journey to see if there's even an opportunity to work together. There may not be, right. right? But you're building up trust every step along the way and they know you're trying to help them and that that's what people are looking for. If, if you're after a sale and you're trying to trick somebody and manipulate the situation or use the latest spin selling technique, you know what? They're fun stuff, but you're not going to have a good heart or may not have a good heart and ultimately that leads to fear. And if you're gaming the situation, you're going to get fear. And let's describe that heart because a lot of people call it different things, giving an S or caring Mm -hmm. or being emotionally attached to uh, what you're doing, that you really care about it. You know, it's the best thing Uh, because what I see in B players is they don't care. They're going through a process. Transactional. Right. It works. It doesn't work. I'll find somebody else. And the managers are pushing them that way by doing the 50 of these things, the hundred of those things without thinking, without who's, who's most likely to care about this. Who's a good Ahmed? Because I'm sure you run into the kids that you can spend, they're not into football. Football is not their bag. Yeah. 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 And that's great. Cause it's just a vehicle. That's all it is. It is. It, it's yeah. And, and it might be something else. Might be music, might be science, might be video games. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Brian. Right. And what you're trying to do is connect with them and get them to use those skills and apply it to something that will get them what they want. Yeah. They have to have passion because you know what, you know, when you know, if you have passion, when you, when it's minus 10 
and you got to take your foot out of your two feet out of your bed, you know if you got passion right there. Yeah. Like, and, and it's getting to that flow state because I see it in you because that you, what they call helpers high. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. It's the best feeling. And you what you make more money. Here's the thing. Here's a dirty little secret, folks. By helping people, you'll make more money than you ever thought you'd make. Yes. And you know what? If you're scheming people and you're greedy. Uh, and, you're, and you're trying to make money, you probably won't. And the reason being is you're not curious. You don't spend the right. extra hour. You don't have the passion. You don't un- take a few more layers off the onion, right? Yeah. But if you love what you're doing and you're helping people, man, why are they paying me for this job? I do it for free. Okay. And that's it because you go back to the mammal brain. Of course they want that because it's the parenting, it's the partnership, it's helping being part of the tribe. And what fear is in the mammal's mind is, you're trying to go outside the tribe, and if you don't succeed, you're ostracized. You're off the island. Yeah, sounding pretty Canadian there right now, Brian. Am I? I'm yeah. half Canadian, so. Are you really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because in Canada, you have the tall poppy syndrome, unfortunately, where you get too high. <laughs> yeah. That's why. That's why. And I think people right, have right, to right. understand the science of fear is that it, it is natural. It's not unnatural. Anytime. We've all had fear. I mean, yeah, and I think... Fear. Like even if you look at school, half why do we have to go to a building? It's because we have to be concentrated time. It's mm-hmm. not that there's magic in that building, especially today where you can turn on YouTube and get the best teachers in the world talking about the hardest topics in the most eloquent way. Mm-hmm. But you still have to have the discipline to watch it, listen it, and then internalize it. Yeah, no, I agree with you, Brian. How do you how do you like, how do you handle fear? I'm sure you still have some. But, oh, oh yeah, because um, you know I went from engineering and I was shyest in my high school class, so the idea of dealing with people, strangers, was incredibly fearful. And I had the desire, and a lot of it was just pushing, repetition, um, you know, mental exercises of you know all kinds of things of tricks I did. You know, trying to make it a joke, trying to start with humor, learn how to break the ice, uh, not worrying about the outcome, but just engaging with people, breaking it into tiny little pieces so you'd have miniature successes instead of a binary yes or no. And I hate the people who say, go for the no. It's like, you're already there. You don't have to do anything to get the no. Yeah, 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 sure. Right? Put a little effort into getting a yes, right? Take a little baby step, a little action. And the momentum kind of builds off of itself. You know, Brian, no one likes to be sold. They like to be helped. And right. And if you help them, they're going to come. And, or not. Or not. And if they don't, that's not a bad thing either. Maybe it's not a fit. That's and okay. that's it. And none of the sales processes teach anybody how to have an organic conversation. Because I say the fastest way uh, to get a no is act like a salesperson. Absolutely. Pitch. Talk about you. Pressure. Every, that, yeah, and I apologize for doing a little bit of that today, right? But just telling the story. But absolutely, it's about helping folks out, and and you feel great, and and you have no, and you have more energy, and you and you sell more, and and you're helping more people. It's just a vicious, like a good circle, not a vicious circle, a really good positive circle. That's it, because a sales conversation is the opposite of an organic conversation. Well, yeah, because we can structure. No, you know, I'm trained by Procter and Gamble, so you want to talk about structure? They got structure, right? But um, if it comes across that way, you're dead. Right. Right? You're dead. You're dead. Right. Absolutely. But when you when you're approaching, because you're the antithesis of what those kids want in their life. Oh yeah, I'm the last thing, you know. Last thing, you want, like, right? Freaking old. I did, you know, my hip hop is I'm okay, but not great. Right. You, know, you don't get us. You don't, don't understand. Get, I'm, right. You know, I'm a boomer. It's all the bad things, man. Right. But, but what what translates is when you that trust that you build by them sensing them. that you care about them. them. I'd fight. I got their backs. I'd fight for them, and no one's helping these kids out. So you know. So, and how, how do you? Do you do coach a lot of salespeople now? Um, not as many as I used to. I used to have a team of 40, which is a lot. Wow. Yeah. yeah. But we're just a couple now. And, uh, but we're actually, you know what? We have more customer service people. Now, this is good, right? When you think about it, we have more product people, more marketing people, more customer service people. So in terms of direct sales, only a few. But we've never done so much sales. Yeah. So, 
everybody's more specialized, being brought into the right con- the conversation, the, the right conversation, the right people, the right time. Yeah. Because I see most companies go in the wrong direction as far as sales. What are you seeing, Brian? I see a lot of people hiring people right out of college who, mm-hmm. who probably have never spent more than an hour talking on the phone in their whole life because all they do is They're text today. Talk right? about fear there, man. There's a lot of fear on the phone. You want me to call a stranger yeah, yeah. that's 10, 20 years older than me, try and tell them that I know more about their business than they do. I can't text them? Come on. I can't text them, right? So they stick with email and they just write their life story and a begging for 15 minutes of time and not earning it. Yeah. And, st- and they don't know how to engage with other people. They so don't know. So when you think about it, the phone call still works, right? Because you just got to be patient to track it, it down. It, it can. It can well, work. And, and that empathy of understanding where are they right now, most likely they're unaware yeah. of you, the problem, the company. Yeah. And then they'll go do the research, which everybody does now. They're great sources of research. Yeah. And how, when, when do you see this person that you know is going to be a great salesperson? Okay. Despite what you just said about hiring them young, I pretty there. I always I hire a uh, higher talent, not skill. Yeah. And uh, somebody the high, high ceiling and then look for some of those internal things, uh, w- what their background is, what, you know, things that they've had adversity in their life that they've, things aren't easy. If you can find that. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, just knowing you got to be a little more patient with a younger person. Um, and maybe don't put them to, you know, throw them to the wolves right away. Have them in one of the customer service jobs. Or, yeah. How, how about like coachability? Can you sense when someone can take feedback or they, they're so protective? Well, you know when they can't take feedback. You can tell that. That's true. Yeah. You can yeah. tell that immediately. But there's still a lot of people that you have to get through them in different ways. And, yeah. and there's no one way. Um, not one size fits all. And, uh, and uh, so I, it's, you know, I've never seen that yet. I think we're doing better with salespeople. I think there, there's more hope actually than ever. And it's just finding that nobody goes to sales on purpose. Okay. Right. I, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I, 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 I haven't met a, a single one. Say so when I'm six years old, dad, I want to go to sales or mom, I want to go to sales. No, I didn't. You know, it's, it's either the two reasons I say they're money motivated or they can't do anything else. <laughs> Yeah, right. I don't <laughs> I in Western Canada, I never came back. I and love, and love that's it. it because you got to understand that they go into this profession, you know, no, right. The, the, it's a very different motive. And the people who love it, because I've interviewed hundreds of great salespeople, none of them <laughs> fit into the classic model of what you would think of as a salesperson. Yeah, and introverts make great salespeople also, right? People are always shocked by that. By that. Back. right because they're right. curious they listen listen yeah right not one what i would consider super extrovert the person who's the gregarious you know who could light up a room <coughs> they're all just kind of nice people calm you know take time patience and listen to the other person have great questions empathy and curiosity well, when you think about it, Brian, this is going to sound really funny because we're talking about business here. Much like artists, okay? When I've met a lot of rock and roll singers over the years. And typically, they're pretty introverted. Right? Even though on stage, they may be very flamboyant or comedians. Behind the scenes, they're usually introverted, right? Because they're always sizing things up, studying it, writing it. You know, that's how they come up with all these lyrics and sketches and, and all these things. But when they're on stage, they're on. Like when those lights come on, they're on. Right. And then they're all three go lights come down. They're all three go steps aside. But it's amazing. I think we have ever studied that and how salespeople aren't that much different. A lot of them are superstars, but when the lights come down, they, they kind of plug out and they do their own thing. Right. Cause it's a performance much like sport <coughs> yeah. playing football. It's a performance. You get all this practice. It's game day. You know, you have, it has to be ingrained in your subconscious because it's moving too fast for you to think about it. That's right. Yeah. So, so Brian, I don't know how, how you've been doing for time on, on our call today is I, I, I love talking about fear because <laughs> yourself, yourself is a great motivator, but ultimately love wins. Love wins every single time for having a good heart. You can open up any door. Cool. Hey, for the people who want to connect with you and follow you, where should they go? Yeah. So check out the better software company.com. But what I would say is that marketplace to the future, in fact, 
software is becoming a commodity. I know people don't like to hear that. And everyone's got the same features, the same benefits and all this over time, right? It, or I just saw Simon Sinek, he talked about the infinite game. You might be better today, but not better tomorrow. What I would say marketplaces where you have community building community and we built the world's largest rental marketplaces called rockify.com. Check it out. We're adding a service layer to it in a year's time. And as millions of people come to this platform community, um, to me, that's the future. And so check out ruckify.com or Ruckify RV. And I think, uh, you know, I'd be happy to discuss that with anybody. And maybe there's a future play for them at some point. Because sports is a game. It is uh, a win or lose, typically, uh, and an improvement. It breaks your skills down into little steps. I, I use chess a lot as a metaphor, uh, Sudoku puzzles. They're all really good ways of keeping our brain moving. Uh, too often we get too comfortable, especially in the larger complex sale, when there's a time gap between uh, conversations, between interactions. And what ends up happening is uh, interest tends to dissipate, uh, dry up. It tends not to increase when we're not uh, contacting people. Uh, these are all issues that I cover in closing the complex sale. If you've got deals that are getting stuck out there, check out that course at B2B Revenue. The letter B, the number two, the letter B, and then the word revenue.com. I, I got all the frequently asked questions in the show notes. Just swipe up to see them, as well as a sample email if you want to try and get your manager to pay for it. But becoming great at sales is a lot of listening to other people go through the particular problems, talking it through with other people. So you get community, you get coaching, and you get content. Probably the world's largest library of one-on-one -on -one coaching, of office hours, of winning the complex sale, and how to get meetings, how to get conversations started. And I frankly laugh when I look at what other people are doing. Oh, it's just a rehash on a pitch. And yes, you can make it relevant and personal, but it's still a pitch. It's still a begging for 15 minutes that the person, you don't know where they are. Uh, no matter what you say, unless you happen to find them at the right moment where there is a need and they're in market, then you have a chance. So it, it's really like trying to find a needle in the haystack. Why not pick the people that you want to talk to and build a conversation with them so that they will talk to you? share what they're really facing, and you can then build it into a business conversation. And I show you a step-by-step -step way of doing it at scale. This is not a slow process. This is a fast process that scales. That course is start the conversation, get the meeting. Both courses you can pay monthly in 12 monthly payments. It's not a membership though, so just make sure you understand that. Uh, or you can pay all at once, up to you. They all include office hours, which is an our meetup every other Friday, and unlimited one-on-ones, which is a 30-minute Zoom call with me applying the course, not taking the course, but applying it to your particular situation. Those are recorded and put in the course so other people can benefit from them. Don't need to know your name, your product, your customer's name, just the problem that you're trying to solve and the strategy you're trying to execute. I hope you enjoyed this. Please make sure you're checking out the other podcasts. I had a great episode this week on the B2B Revenue Leadership Show. So I'm putting in um, kind of enterprise reps up there as well. I've got a pretty good backlog. Also, if you want to be on the show, let me know. Connect up with me on LinkedIn. Just send me a note uh, in, in mail and we'll make that happen. What else? Sales questions. Brutally honest answers. Oh, did I tell you I'm restarting the career strategy podcast? I had put it on hiatus just because I was busy, but now I understand a lot of people are struggling uh, to either find a job or be successful at the current job. So I'm taking questions for that podcast and putting the answers up there. I'm going to try and do it as many times as I can. So I'm not going to set a particular schedule, but check that out, Career Strategy. Just search for that on your favorite podcast player, and we'll see you next time. Also, check out the YouTube channel, Brian Burns Sales on YouTube. And if you happen to like the podcast, could you just give me a little thumbs up if you see my content on LinkedIn? Uh, there's a company page for each of the podcasts, so just go and search that, follow it. 
Uh, if you see my content flying by with my pretty little face, give it a thumbs up. I'd appreciate it. We'll see you next time.